Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Nidarim Daf Vav. We're going to get started at the top. Just a quick review of what we did yesterday. We saw Shmuel, who talked about Yadayim She'en Mochichot. We had, again, there's, let's go, go through the three categories. We have a Yad, which is a cut-off language of a vow. And then we have one where you cut your language off, but it's very clear what you mean. Everybody agrees that, that's a, that that counts. That was way back we had different places of where we learn Yadayim from the Torah. Okay, there were, we had three different possibilities, right? Is it learned out from Nezer, Nezirut? Okay, there were three options there. That's Yad of a Neder. Then we had a deliberation about what if it's, if it's a Yad She'en Muchach, it's not clear at all what you mean, then obviously that's not a complete statement. This is, again, going back to the whole idea of what words can create. So, words, if they're not clear in the slightest, of course they can't create a vow. But if they're at this in-between stage, that's what we have a debate about. Shmuel says, even if it's not 100% clear, and it could be you mean this, it could be you mean that, we're stringent about it. Okay, this, by the way, comes up later, that benedarim, we're machmir, so therefore, since it's possible you meant a neder, we're going to say that the vow is, is there. Okay, works. So he says, sorry, um, I made a mistake. Shmuel says it doesn't work. Sorry about the confusion. Shmuel says it's no good. If you have a yad she'en o muchach, okay, it's not going to be considered a yad. Then we brought this machlok at Abai Rava, and Abai says it is a yad, and Rava says it's not a yad. Okay, Rava goes with Shmuel, that if it's not clear, we're not going to rule it like a yad. Abaye goes more in the direction of we're going to be strict and say, you know what, since it could have been, you made a neder, you meant a neder, we're going to say it's a neder. Then what did we do? We took a machloket between uh, Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis by get. What language has to be written in the get? Does it have to be a clear, very complete language, which would say Yad Shein Abuchach is not valid? Or is it enough to have an incomplete language? Which isn't 100% clear. There were two things we talked about that weren't clear. Number one, it's not clear. Are you using, is it not clear? It's not clear that you're using the document as affecting the get, affecting with an E, right, to make it take effect? Or is it not clear that you're saying from me to you, from the husband to the wife? Is that the part that's not clear? We talked about both those elements. So that would be a Yad Sheinu Muchach, and the rabbis say it's totally fine, and that would be a Yad. Again, there's an important distinction here, which is the language of the Get is a written language as opposed to a spoken language, which is important to note. Um, that's an, that's a, a, so a side point. The Gemara thinks that they're the same. And then the Gemara lines them up, Abai with Tanakama there, that it works. Haram Uter L'Choladam is enough. Rava, like Rabbi Yehuda, who said you need the more extended language. I actually brought this back on the sheet today just so that you see where we're going with it. Then we rejected it, and then we said, no, it could be, now I want you to remember this, it was specifically Abaye, who, uh, it was specifically the Gemara that came along and said, we don't know that it's so clear that this is the same debate. Maybe Abaye would agree actually with Rabbi Yehuda when it comes to get, because you need a safer creature, a book that, that breaks the bond, and this is not a book that breaks the bond if it just says Harab Mutar Adam. And maybe Rava will agree with Tanakama in this case, in the case of the get, because the, they'll say, eh, you know what? It's really, um, it's really clear. Okay, Haram Mutarat Lakal Adam is clear enough. It's obvious it's him divorcing the wife, and we don't need to be any more clear than this. In which case, we said, maybe it's not the same thing. So keep this in mind as we go in with our daf today. I see someone's asking about Kiddushin. We're going to get to Kiddushin soon. It's going to be the question of Rav Papa on the second part of today's daf. Metive. So what we're going to have on Amud Aleph, okay, I'll tell you the very easy structure of today's stuff. Amud Aleph is two questions from Brightas against Abaye, saying that Yad She'eno Muchach is a Yad, okay, and trying to show you need a more complete language than that. Then we're going to have Rav Papa ask two questions. Is there Yad for Kiddushin? And is there Yad for Pe'a? Other issues, and this is again very interesting, what our Sukh is trying to get at is, Conceptual differences between these things. Yes, they're all done with words. Kiddushin is done with words, but there's also an action associated with it. You pass over money or something, you know, a ring that we do nowadays. Can you have an incomplete language about it? that? Would it work like a neder? Is it like a vow in a sense? What about peah? What about 
the corner of your field that you designate for the poor people. When you designate the corner of your field and you say, this part, right? You don't usually even mark it. You say, this part is pe'ah. Would that be, if it's not clear, would that be the same as a vow? Would it not be? Would we say there's a law of yad there? Interestingly, we're not going to get to answers. Papa's just going to ask us questions. We actually don't have an answer. So let's go with our first two questions against Abai. The first one is a bright that says Meitive. Hare Meitive is a, is a question, introduce, it's a word saying we're introducing a Tanaitic source to contradict an Amora. Hare hu alai, hare ze alai, asu mipneshu yad le korban. If you say, this will be upon me, or this will be, right, uh, this is upon me, or this is upon me, just using whether who or ze, it doesn't really matter. It's a sul because it's a yad for a korban. At this point, the Gemara assumes yad the korban means a korban, you can use the language of sacrifice to forbid something to you also as a neder, as a vow. So this is a korban, that makes it forbidden to you. So it sounds like they're saying this is a neder, okay, this becomes forbidden. Now, Gemara assumes, what about this makes it forbidden? Because you said the word alai, this is forbidden to me. But it sounds like if the word alai was not there and it just said, this, behold, this is, without saying, this is for me. Right now, it's not a huge difference. This is for me or this is. Either which way, you didn't say the key word, which was forbidden, right? This is a ned, this is a korban, this is something. You missed that important word. That makes it a yad. But if you, it seems clear here, you need the word alai. A lie would make it a yad muchach. A lie means a me, meaning this is a me, meaning this is forbidden to me. The same way you would take a korban, if you would take a sacrifice upon you, you want to designate an animal for sacrifice, you'd say, right, this is for me to bring as a sacrifice. Okay, there actually you would say hare ze korban. Okay, you wouldn't even have the word a lie, and we're going to come back to this soon. But if you say something's forbidden to me, you'd say hare ze a lie isu, or ze a lie nede, or you'd use some word. So this is a cutoff language, and because you said a lie, it works, because that makes it clear. But if you had just said harehu, sounds like it would be a yad she'en muchach, it's not clear language, and what does it say here? Now, it doesn't actually say it here, that's important to note. But because it says hareze a lie, or harehu a lie, if it just said harehu, or hareze, that wouldn't be an issue. That wouldn't be, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a valid vow. Which would be a tiyuv to dabai, which go against dabai, would say, what do you mean? That's a yad no muchach, a yad no muchach should be valid. To which, the, right, so Amar Lecha Abayi. Abayi again could answer the following. Tama da amar alai hu da asu. Aval amar harei hu velo amar alai. It doesn't work for a different reason. Now, before we go on, there's three different options of a yad. There's a yad that's clear. There's a yad that's totally unclear. We don't know what on earth you mean. And then there's a yad that's in the middle. It's eno muchach. It can't be proven. But it's likely you meant to forbid something upon yourself. It's just not clear enough. So, comes a buy and he says, this is in category three, the most extreme category, the most unclear category. How do we know you're even making a neder? You're calling this a yad le neder. Who says it's a yad le neder? Now, in a minute, we're going to see they don't actually call it a yad le neder. They call it a yad le korban. It's going to create a little issue here. But Abai says, or again, Abai could say, he's not here to answer, but we could answer for him. The reason why, if you said a lie, it's going to be usur, and harehu is not, if you got rid of the word a lie, is because harehu de hefker, harehu de kamar. You could have meant harehu could mean lots of things. Harehu could be I'm giving this to charity. Harehu could be I'm making this ownerless. And all the more so, it's more likely you said that than harehu, it's forbidden to me, because the language of hefker or tzedakah is, you know, notice, if you said Harehu alai. If you wanted to do a neder, you would have to say harehu alai because a neder is usually for yourself, or maybe you're making something for somebody else. So you would say hare, this is for that person. Asu. It would be a four-word statement. This is cut right. So if you say harehu alai, you've cut off one word. Think of like the game bingo. You know, and each time you take right that song bingo, you take off one letter each time. So um, I don't know. It's the song we used to sing when I was a kid. And every time you take off one letter, right? There's all these songs like that. So in this case, taking off one letter would be a yad. Taking a two, one word. Taking off two words is not even a yad. It's not a yad. 
You can't call this a yad she'eno muchach. It's not even a yad. Okay? If it were for korban or hefker or, or staka, you could say it's a yad. Because those were three word statements. Hareu korban, hareu staka, hareu hefker. But this is a yad for a neder. And it's missing two words. It's not even a yad. So basically, Abai could say, why are you questioning me? Saying this is a yad she'eno muchach. It's not even a yad. Forget about this. Muchach. It's not even a yad. But the Gemara says, but wait, what did the Brayta say? And this is where originally they said Yad the Korban just means Yad the Neder. They say, Vahamipneshu Yad the Korban Katani. It's a Yad for a Korban, not for a Neder. For a Yad for a Korban, it would be a Yad Sheno Muchach. Because it's basically Harehu Korban. It's only missing one word. Theoretically, this could be a Yad Sheno Muchach. Okay? So, because of that, that's not really a good answer. And therefore, they come up with a different answer. Until now, we assumed, and this is a big assumption we made, and the Gemara is going to now make an opposite assumption, which is similar to something we did with Shmua in yesterday's stuff, which is, we assumed, Hareze alai is a soul, that's what the Brayta said, which made us jump to the conclusion that Harehu, without anything, would be mutal, would be permitted, it wouldn't be a neder at all. And that's why we raised the question on Abai. And we're really left in the end with, it does seem like a Yad Sheino Muchach, because it's a Yad for Korban. Yad for Korban is only missing one word. Harehu could be Harehu Korban. And theoretically, that, according to the Brayta, again, according to our inference from the Brayta, would not be valid, which would go against Abai, who said a Yad Sheino Muchach is a Yad, and this seems to say it's not a Yad. To which the Gemara says, no. Let's explain Abai differently, the way Abai reads this Brayta. Now we're going to say it's not that we're going to infer that Harehu is meaningless. Harehu is more strict. It's the opposite direction. The bright had just said Harehu Alai. And what did it say? It's a soul. Now if I say Harehu Alai, this for me will be, right, you're saying for me. You didn't say the word forbidden, so it's cut off language, but it's clear you meant forbidden. What's the halacha according to the Brayta? It will be forbidden to me and not to anyone else. We discussed this in the introduction to the Masechet where we said, Neder is unique in the sense that I'm forbidding something to me and not to anyone else. Whereas if I say something is a, is a hektesh, for example, if I say it's sanctified, so if I were to just say harehu, here they're going to infer something different from the, the Brayta. The bride has said, Hare, the ally will be forbidden, and the other one won't. It's not the other one won't. The other one won't be forbidden in the same manner. This one will be forbidden to me only. Hare, who, which is much more general, could be understood more simply, since it's missing two words to be a neder isur, which is I'm forbidding something to myself. It would be, Hare, who could be understood, and again, if we're going to go machmir, we're going to be stringent when it comes to vows. So we're going to say, Harehu could mean Harehu Hektesh. Maybe you're saying this object is sanctified to the temple. If I'm sanctifying the object to the temple, it's forbidden to everybody. So now we're going to say, according to Abaye, of course a Yad Sheino Muchach is a Yad. And in this case, it's just a Yad for Hektesh, and therefore it's going to be forbidden across the board to everybody. Okay? And therefore we end up with a different understanding of the Brayta, which then won't contradict Abaye. Second question against Abai. Meitivei. Harezo chatat, harezo asham. Normally, the way I take a korban upon myself, a neder or a nedava, you say, harezo chatat. Okay, this is called a neder. You're putting it on the animal. This animal will be for me, but normally, what kind of sacrifices can you take voluntarily? Korban ola, which goes up all entirely to God, or korban shlamin, where the owners eat part of it, peace offerings. Those are the offerings where you generally bring as voluntary offerings. A chatat and an asham are types of sin offering, a guilt offering. Both of those come when you do a particular action that's wrong, and you then bring a sacrifice to atone. You can't bring them as a voluntary offering. There's no such thing. So if you say the language, harezo chatat, harezo asham, you can mean one of two things. Either you want to say, I'm voluntarily bringing this to the temple, which you can't do because there's no such thing. Or you're saying, I owe a korban chatat, 
let's say, I owe a sin offering, this animal will be for my sin offering. So if you said, and you didn't say, my sin offering, you just said, this is a sin offering, this animal. Even if I actually owe a guilt, a sin offering or a guilt offering, it's a meaningless statement. Why is it a meaningless statement? Presumably because it's a yad she'eno muchach. Because I didn't say the important part, which is it's for my sin offering. Maybe my friend needs a sin offering also to bring. It's true, I have one to bring, but maybe they do. And when I said this animal is for a chatat, maybe I meant for someone else. Right? It's not the clear language that we normally use to designate a korban. You would normally say, and this is what we're going to see right now, harezo chatati, harezo ashami. This is for my sin offering. This is for my guilt offering. Then, now it splits into two. If I'm not obligated a sin offering or a guilt offering, then it's a meaningless statement because there's no such thing as volunteering to bring a sin offering or a guilt offering. You can only bring those, as I said, if you're obligated. But if I am obligated to bring one because I did something wrong, and I said, this is for my sin offering, this is for my guilt offering, it would be effective. So, tiyuv tadabai, the first part is a tiyuv tadabai because... Again, it's really a yad no muchach. Again, a yad no muchach is it's not clear what I'm saying, although it's likely that what I meant to say was this is for my sin offering, and yet we say it's not a valid statement. Because e I even have a sin offering to bring. I'm supposed to bring one. And I said this is for a sin offering. I just didn't say it's for my sin offering. It's not effective. This seems to go clearly against Abai. And in fact, Abai is pushed into a corner that the only thing we can say to this is, Amar Abai, Abai can answer, Hamani Rabbi Yehudahi. Ah. When you take a Braita and you question an Amora from a Braita, if he has no other answer, the best answer he could give is, and if he can't explain it according to his approach, the best answer he could give is, what I hold is part of a Tanaitic debate. That Braita that you're quoting me to question my opinion can't be a question against me because it just holds by the other opinion. And we already know that there's a Machloket. Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda by get about Yad She'eno Muchach, is it a Yad or isn't it a Yad? So it comes by and he says, ah, that Braita is Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda holds, Haran Muter Lechol Adam doesn't work, right? He holds Yad She'eno Muchach doesn't work. And therefore, I'm just going to say that Braita is Rabbi Yehuda's position. Now, what did we do at the end of yesterday's stuff? And right, we reviewed it at the beginning of today's stuff. We said, it's not necessarily the same machloka. Remember, we said, Abaye could say, I hold like Tanakama. Uh, sorry, Abaye could say, I even hold like Rabbi Yehuda, right? And Ged is different. Like by Ged, I'll agree with him, but so it's a little bit difficult. So the Gemara says, how can you say that? Vaha Abaye, Yehuda Amal, right? Look back at Ham bed at the bottom. Abaye is the one who said, Ana da Amra, Filula Rabbi Yehuda. I hold even like Rabbi Yehuda. This is a little bit of a tricky line. Why is it tricky? Abayi didn't really hold, didn't say, I hold like Rabbi Yehuda. Okay? In other words, what did we say at the end of yesterday's daf? And I, I specifically told you this yesterday. Amar lecha Abayi means the Gemara is putting words in Abayi's mouth. Abayi could say. What did we do in the Gemara there? We tried to say, Abayi and Rava line up exactly with Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda. And then Abayi doesn't hold like Rabbi Yehuda. To which the Gemara rejected it and said, Abayi theoretically could hold like Rabbi Yehuda. And Rabbah theoretically could hold like Tanakama, and it's not the same machloket. So what the Gemara here is doing is not Abayi himself, really. And that's going to be a little difficult by the answer. You'll see in a minute. But you have to understand the Gemara is saying, didn't the Gemara explain Abaye as saying, maybe it's not the same machloket, and Ged is different. If Ged is different, then you can't say this Braita, when it talks about Nadir, is like Rabbi Yehuda, where Rabbi Yehuda by Get wouldn't necessarily say the same thing that he would by Nadir. Right? It could be he requires it by Get, we said, but not by Nadir, in which case right, it wouldn't fit. So the Gemara says, Hadrabe. The Gemara says, Abaye changed his mind. But again, it's not Abaye, it's tricky with the words. It's not Abaye, it's the Gemara. In other words, the suggestion we brought that maybe Abaye fits in exactly with Tanakama and Rava fits in exactly with Rabbi Yehuda, maybe isn't true. Uh, sorry, when we ch the suggestion that we rejected and then said, no, 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 each one could explain the other, we're going to change that. We're going to reject that. And basically erase the end of yesterday's daf. And now it's going to be how much of yesterday's daf are we going to erase. But basically, 
they change their mind about it. And really, Abai holds like Tanakama against Rabbi Yehuda. It's the same machloket for get and for um, and for neder. In which case, Abai can say this brayta that contradicts me. Eh, it's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. And Rabbi Yehuda is across the board. Get and right. It's the same thing. To which the Gemara says. Okay, if you're changing it all, then you're changing it all. Meaning, what about Rava? Elalema Rava Damar Rabbi Yehuda. Could you explain? Right? Are you saying now, if Abaye definitely holds like Tanakama, which is what we said, and definitely disagrees with Rabbi Yehuda, then what about the other side? Does Rava definitely agree with Rabbi Yehuda and can't explain the rabbis according to his approach, which we tried to say that he does? Right? That theoretically. Rava could go with Rabbi, with Tanakama there and get Haram Uter Lechaladam is enough because it's very clear what you mean. And in Neder, we're going to have to be more specific. So the Gemara says, no, just because we're switching Abaye's tune doesn't mean we have to switch Rava. We can stick with what Rava said. We can say that Abaye basically says, I only hold by Tanakama, get is the same thing. Rava could theoretically distinguish still because we didn't have any question on Rava. We weren't pushed into a corner to have to undo what we did yesterday about Rava. And therefore, they're going to repeat exactly what we saw at the end of yesterday's da into the beginning of today's, which was, Rava could say, Rava, Rava could say, I hold even like the rabbis, meaning I don't only hold like Rabbi Yehuda that you have to be super specific by, by get. Why? Because I come to Rabbanan to lobi inin adayim ochichot get. When the rabbi said, you need Dadaim Mochichot, they said it's, that you don't need Dadaim Mochichot, they said it specifically by get. Why? Because there's no other way to understand it. Nobody's divorcing somebody else's wife. It's clear he's divorcing his own wife. You don't need to be super specific about it. Haram Buterat Lekol Adam is sufficient. Aval Ba'alma, but when it comes to other cases like vows, Be'inan Yadaim Mochichot. So while we undid half of what we saw yesterday. We only undid half and not all of it. We basically said Abaye would be consistent and say the get is the same issue and you have to be, right, you don't have to be clear about your language. And Rava, who said you have to be clear about your language, theoretically can only say it by get, by neder, doesn't necessarily say it by get. Okay, that was the first part. So we had two questions against Abaye. The first way we answered it was to Re, we, it was all from an inference from a brighter, so we just inferred kind of the opposite from, right, somewhat the opposite, but something different from it. Instead of saying, if you don't say the word Allah, it's nothing, we actually say, if you don't say Allah, it's actually worse. And then we had Harezo Khatat Harezo Hashem, where it sounded like it's not, oh, well, yeah, Abai is just going to say, that's someone else's approach, not my approach. And therefore, I hold like the rabbis, this bride has t- is Rabbi Yehuda. And therefore, he resolves the contradiction against him. Again, it's not him. It's the Gemara coming in place of Abai. Now we get to our two questions. By Rav Papa. Papa's going to ask two questions. As I told you before, there's not going to be an answer. Yesh yad the kiddushid olo. Is there such a thing as yad for kiddushin or not? If you use a cut-off language. Now, cut-off language here is going to mean something a little bit different. Hechidami. What's the case? Ilema, this is going to be a little, you wouldn't really find this nowadays, right? I was at a wedding last night. Definitely this kind of thing didn't happen. Where? If you want to say, if you want to say, I mean, it's always going to be rejected. If you want to say, what's the question? The question is about a case like this, where he turns to one woman and says, you're betrothed to me. And then he says to the woman next to her, and you too, thankfully didn't happen at the wedding last night, uh, pshita. That would be obvious. Okay? It would be obvious that, that what? This would work. Okay, you're thinking this would be obvious. It wouldn't work. You just betrothed one woman. But no, in those days, you could theoretically, a man could betroth two women. So, right, nowadays we can't do that anymore. It's Kanat Rabbeinu Gershom, so it wouldn't really it would be a problem. But in those days, if you did that, pshita. Hainu kidushin atzman. That's not called a yad. That is very clear. Why is that very clear? Because you said, and then you turned to someone else and you said, and you too. And presumably you gave money. Okay. Now you might have given some of the commentaries that maybe you give money to one woman and you're basically appointing her like a messenger to give to the other woman without getting into all the details of the messenger and what the case was exactly. But basically there was money for both. And you basically said, you're a and you. 
Now, before we move on, uh, uh, let's move on and then we'll explain. El, kigon. So what must be the case? Kigon da amr la isha. Now, I want to be clear here before we move on. And I want to be clear because it's going to be a little bit unclear after, but they're talking here and it's clear from the sugya, they're talking about a yad muchach. They're not getting into the question of yadayim she'ena mochichot and if it's unclear. They're talking about clear language, but that's cut off language. Okay, so this, they say, isn't even cut off language because that's full language. That's saying, you're mekudesh at me, and you too, you too means, right? It's like you're saying ditto to the line before, which means you, it's as if you said the line twice. So that's a clear statement. What's a cutoff language? Ela kigon de amar lali isha harea mekudesh at says to the first, you're betrothed to me. V'amar lechaverta ve'at. And then he turns to the second woman and says, and you, without saying, and you also. So now, and here's where it gets a little tricky. Because now they're going to say, it's not clear what he means. Now, it's a little bit weird because they're trying to prove a yad muchach and not a yad she'eno muchach. So some people explain this a little bit differently, which is not mi amrina means do we say, meaning you have to read it as, at least according to some interpretations, this one made sense to me, do we rule as if we say that this is what he said. In other words, we assume it's a yabuchach, and that what he really meant to do is to marry her also, to betroth her, by saying ve'at, and you. But do we rule that at nami amar la lechaverta, v'tav seba kiddushin lechaverta? In other words, if we say yesh yad lechidushin, then we'll say you're also betrothed, just like your friend. The at means it's a cutoff language, you too. You just didn't say the word to, right? T-O-O. So it works. Or, O Dilma, or do we rule and say, At chazay amr la lechaverta, v'lo taf seba kiddushin bechaverta. It's saying, you see what I'm doing, right? And you means, and you see, and you're watching, and you see that I'm betrothing your friend, and then there's no kiddushin. Okay, now, what, what's tricky about this, and I, I don't like to say the things that are unclear because I want you to come out with understanding this clearly, but there's a little lack of clarity in this. So again, there's not much to be said. Like it's, it's hard because this seems to be implying that it's a Yad She'en Obuchach, that the and you could be understood in two ways, but that's not the way the Sugya really reads. The Sugya is talking about a Yad Muchach, a clear declaration, and therefore the commentaries suggest here that what they mean is, do we rule as if you're betrothed her, or do we rule as if you just said, and I see? And then she's not really betrothed. Okay, so it's more like, do we rule that she's betrothed? Or do we rule she's not betrothed? Even though it's pretty clear you meant to betroth her as well. To which the Gemara says, but I'm pointing out that there's something not so clear about the simple reading of the sugi here, which happens sometimes. Umim, now the Gemara, instead of answering the question, they're going to ask a question on the question. How could Rav Papa have even asked this question? Umim, Rav Papa? Did he really ask this question? Isn't it obvious from something else he said that it's clear that he thinks there's Yad for Kiddushin? Now we're going to quote a line of Rav Papa that's very similar to a line Rav Papa had on, on Ham Bet, but kind of the reverse. I'll get back to that in a minute. But in Masech Kiddushin, where it's talking about Kiddushin and all this stuff, and Yadot in Kiddushin, Rav Papa Labai, Rav Papa said to Abai, which was exactly, okay, it's almost exactly like a statement that Rav Papa said at the top of Ham Bet, which was, Rav Papa said, we'll, we'll get back to it in a minute, but Rav Papa says to Abai, Mi sever Shmuel, does Shmuel really hold yadayim she'em mochichot havim yadayim? Does Shmuel really hold by Kiddushin that a yad that's not clear is a yad, which would imply what? If a yad she'en omuchach, Shmuel thinks is a yad, and Rav Papa's questioning that, it would seem clear that a yad that's clear would definitely be. The question's only about a yad that's not clear. And he says, what, does Shmuel really hold a yad that's not clear as a yad? Okay, I just want to point out, before we move on, I'm leaving you mid-sentence, but at the top of Hamu Bet, Rav Papa said to Abaye the same kind of line about Shmuel, but it was actually the reverse line. He said, by us, does Shmuel really say by neder that a yad she'eno muchach is not a yad? And Rav Papa said in Kiddushin, does Shmuel really hold that a yad she'eno muchach in Kiddushin is a yad? Obviously, Shmuel had different approaches in both places, and Rav Papa was surprised about each. Maybe because he knew about one, questioned that, found out, oh, it's true, and then kind of questioned the other, but he's saying the opposite. 
Okay, that Shmuel seemed to have had an opposite approach, but Yadayim Shein and Mechachot for Kiddushin and for for uh, for Neder. But either which way, that's not the important part. I just in case your head went to there, I wanted you to see the comparison. But the point is that how can Rav Papa question if a Yad? Yeah, remember, you always have to keep this in mind. Three categories of Yadot. One is a Yad Muchach, a clear. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm sorry, that is our question. Sorry, that's our question. Yad She'eno Muchach is what Rav Papa was talking about, Shmuel. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's Yad that's like totally unclear and that no one thinks is a Yad. So now Rav Papa said to Abai, does Shmuel really hold a Yad She'eno Muchach is a Yad? Which would imply, from there you can infer what? The Svira Leila Rav Papa, the Yesh Yad Kiddushin. He must hold there is Yad. He's just surprised by Shmuel who holds the, in a, he holds a Yad Muchach as a Yad, and his question is about a Yad She'en Muchach. And he's saying, Shmuel really holds a Yad She'en Muchach as a Yad? If you question Yad She'en Muchach, but it's obvious the Yad Muchach would be a Yad. So how could Rav Papa even be asking this question? To which the Gemara has a very clear answer, which is an answer they give in a lot of places. Chada, some people cut this word Chada, because Chada means singularly one, it doesn't really make sense here in the context, so we can skip the word. But Migo, my Desfira Leila Shmuel, Amar Leila Abai. Rav Papa was talking to Abai about Shmuel's opinion himself, and the Shmuel's opinion. He wasn't talking at all about himself. He was, he deliberated. Is there Yah by Kiddushin? Is there not Yah by Kiddushin? And he didn't know what the answer was. He said, but to Shmuel, who it's obvious there's Yah by Kiddushin, but does he re- that when it's clear, does he really think that when there's Yad She'eno Muchach, it's also treated as a Yad? In other words, his whole question about Shmuel was only according to Shmuel's logic. What he was saying was, Shmuel says Yad She'eno Muchach is a Yad for Kiddushin. And what he's saying is this, does he really hold that way? I understand he holds yes, there's Yad for Kiddushin when it's clear, but does he really hold when it's unclear we're still going to treat it as a Yad and still count as Kiddushin? But that was all Rav Papa talking to Abai about Shmuel's opinion. But he himself deliberated whether it was Yad for Kiddushin or not. There he was just talking about in Shmuel's world and Shmuel's worldview about this. So yes, I understand Shmuel thinks it's Yad for Kiddushin, but I myself am not so clear about it. Okay? So that's our question. We don't have an answer. Bye, Rav Papa. Oh, so before we move on, I want to point out something important, which is, what makes Kiddushin different from a Neder? That we have a question about this. So, Kiddushin is different from Neder because Neder is done by words alone. And that's why when you do something by words alone, again, this is part of the deliberation. I'm not saying this is definite, but one way of looking at it is since it's words alone, maybe even looser kind of words, you know, un- less clear kind of words or, or cut off words, even though they're clear but they're cut off, that's still going to be a creation of a Neder. But Kiddushin has an action associated with it as well. It's not just words. It's also an action. It's also passing on a ring or something like that. So now, you might say, one logic would say, well, if there's an action and your words are less clear, it doesn't really matter because your action proves what you're trying to do, in which case there would be Yad Le Kiddushin. But the other alternative is to say no. Since it's not affected with words but with actions and words, Maybe your words have to be more clear. Again, it's not so logical. Why? But it could be it's just treated differently than neder. Neder is something that's exclusively words. Nothing else. There's no action associated with your taking on a vow. So that makes Kiddushin somewhat different from neder. Okay, and that's what really we're getting at at the sugi here, which is what are the differences, right? Get is even more different, right? And that was why we tried to compare, but then said maybe it's not comparable. Because get is written, right? It's weird that they're even using yad in written language. Because right, it almost sounds like they're talking about the words you say, but it's not the words you say. It's the words you write down. And, and there it's a yad that's written. So it's interesting the way they're borrowing this term and using it in different ways and in different kind of circumstances. So that's, uh, that's conceptually what's going on here, which is trying to put things into different frameworks. How do we view things that are words alone? How do we view things that are words with actions? Things that are written with actions? Because right, the get in- involves writing the get, the written word there, passing the get on. Okay, even nowadays there's there's a text set when you give the get. You say those words, by the way, that, that we talked about that are written. Next question. So again, getting into where do we where do these things fall in categories? Where how do we categorize them? 
So by Rav Papa, yesh yad lepe'ah or ain yad lepe'ah? Is there a dean of yadot also by pe'ah? Pe'ah is when I designate the corner of my field for poor people. Now again, designating, maybe I mark something off, but it's really, I say this corner is pe'ah, and then it becomes pe'ah. Just like I designate money for charity, and it becomes charity. That's going to be another question. Is there yad for tzedakah or not? Is there yad for hefker, for making something ownerless? So the, those are the two next questions we're going to get to in tomorrow's stuff. So Rav Papa says, Yesh yad the pe'ah, ain yad the pe'ah. So again, hechidami, what's the case? If you say this section of my field will be pe'ah, and this also, then hainu pe'ah mal yatahi. Again, just like the kiddushin. If you say and this also, it's very clear what you meant. Ki kamibayle. My question is, ki gonda amal vehaden velo amal nami. Again, you said this is pe'ah and this, and you didn't say and this what. That is a cutoff statement. That's a yad. So the question is, is it pea or is it not pea? My. To which the Gemara now says, we're going to infer something from what you just said. We're going to assume, if I took pea as a minimum 160th, if I take 100th of my field and I say this is pea, and then I go to the section right next to it, which will kind of fill it in to the, get to the amount of 160th, and I say, and, th and this, without saying, and this also, it will be obvious that that's peah also, because I haven't yet taken enough of my field and set it aside. So therefore, the Gemara assumes we must be talking about that the first time you did it, the first time it was set on 160th, and you fulfilled your obligation. And now we're talking about additional part of your field. To which the Gemara says, Michla, from here you can infer, Dechiyamar sadeh kulu t'ave peah, have your peah. Are you trying to infer here that you can go on forever and I can make if I want my entire field pea? Because it sounds like if I said this is pea and then I said and this on the rest of my field, I can turn that into pea, which would sound like you can make your whole field pea. And the Gemara is questioning that. Is that really true? Can you make your entire field pea? To which the Gemara says, in you can. Right? You would think you can't because what is pea literally means a corner. A corner means I'm taking part and not the whole. To which the Gemara says, no, you actually can. The Hatan, you hear, is a bright to prove it. How do you know if you really wanted, you could make your entire field pea and basically make it all for poor people? Talmud Lomar, pea Because it says corner field, as opposed to saying pea bisadcha, a corner in your field. If it said a corner in your field, as opposed to a corner of your, well, kind of of your field, I guess it would be the way you would say it. You said corner in your field. Again, this is the world of Drashot. One could argue it otherwise. A corner in your field is the way they think is the simple way to say it. would mean a corner in your field. But if you say my whole field, that would be okay because it said pe'at sadcha. Okay, so therefore, pe'at sadcha, corner field without designating specifically anything specific here, we're going to say that allows you to do your whole field. It's not exactly true, by the way. Because pe'at can only be taken after you start to cut some of your crops. So it would have to be, you cut a little bit of your crops, because it says, as you're reaping, as you're cutting there. So you would have to cut something, a minimum amount, and then you could turn your entire field to pay out. So it's only mostly true, I would say. Okay, so just so you know, if you ever want to do that, make your entire field pay out, you have to cut off a little part first, I don't know how many of you own fields, cut off a little part first, and then you can make the whole thing pay out. So that was an aside, just that was a, an assumption that came out of that, that, that if you say, and this, the fact that we've been suggesting maybe you can make a pea would sound like, theoretically, you could make a pea if you were clear about it. And here the question is only about a yacht. So now we go back to what's the real deliberation here? What's the deliberation? Is yesh yad the pea or ain yad the pea? Mi amrina, do we say? Kevan de itkish the korbanot. There's a hekesh in the verse between korbanot and pe'ah. We don't yet know where. We'll see that in one more minute. Just take it as a given right now. They appear in the same verse together. Because of that, we learn one to the other. Now, the topic of that sentence, of that pasuk, is not delaying give, bringing your sacrifices. Okay? So now the question becomes, because they have this hekesh in the verse between sacrifices and leaving the corner of your field, and the topic of the sentence is, don't delay bringing your korbanot, which would mean also, don't delay giving, leaving the corner of your field, right? When you start 
doing the ktsira, the reaping, the, the cutting, that's when you should do the pa'ah, don't delay. So do we say, ma korbano, do we say, we make a hekesh across the board in all sorts of topics. So for example, ma korbano yesh lem yad, just like I could say harehu, and it could be a yad for a korban. Af pe'ah yesh lem yad, also pe'ah has a yad. O dilma, or perhaps, ki it takash lebalta acheru di takash. When we make this hekesh, it's only for the issue said in the verse, which is balta acher. This is a question with juxtapositions in general. When you have two things juxtaposed, can you start learning all sorts of things? We had that in the beginning of the Masechet, where we did the juxtaposition, neder de nedarim, and we started learning all sorts of things, not just what was mentioned in the context of that verse. So now the Gemara, and that's the deliberation. Again, we're not going to have an answer. But that's the deliberation. Do we learn it from Korbanot because of this Hekesh and therefore learn whatever's true for Korbanot is true for this? Or is the Hekesh much more specific just for this issue of not delaying doing it? Hecha itakash. So now where is this Hekesh? I'm going to end with that. Titania me'imach zeleket shechau pe'ah. So without reading the Pasuk, we don't understand what they're referring to. The Pasuk is in Devarim chapter 23, verse 22. It's a pasuk we saw already in this mesecha. Ki tidor neder l'ashem. When you make a vow to Hashem, halakecha, lo ta'acher l'shamo. Don't delay paying it. Do it on time. Ki darosh yidrashenu Hashem halakecha. Because God will demand it from you. Me'imach from you. Vayav chachet. And you'll sin if you don't do it on time. Now theoretically, the word me'imach is a little bit unnecessary. And from there they learn. Why does it say me'imach? It comes to teach you not just sacrifices, also, so this is funny, it's a hekesh on a drasha, right? This word me'imach comes to include ze leket shechau Brief review, leket is when you're gathering in the fields and you drop some as you're gathering. So whatever you drop, you have to leave, unless you drop a certain amount too much. Like if you drop three already, you can pick them up, but if you drop one or two, you have to leave Shikha is what you leave behind when you're gathering your, your, your bundles. You forget a barrel, a bundle behind or two bundles. You have to leave them for the poor. And pe'a is the corner of your field. So those are all learned from the word me'imach. Therefore, they're juxtaposed in the verse. And the whole question is that they juxtapose just for Baal Ta'akhir or also for all intents and purposes, which would include Yad. And that's his question. And as I said before, we don't have an answer to the question. We'll continue with a few more questions tomorrow. Like I said, is there Yad for Tzedakah? Is there Yad for Hefka? That's it for today. See you all tomorrow.